And also because a lot of these, some of these folks had participated in efforts for a long time with no fruition, if I can say that word, they also decided that they wanted a very defined timeline to achieve their success. And, and uh, a couple of the members of the steering committee said, we want to see something done by August 2007. And as one of the facilitators, I at first said, are you kidding me? But we actually did it. Um, the first piece of the hard work was uh, developing consensus based restoration principles, and this was truly a consensus-based operation. Uh, the rules of the game were that if you did not agree with one of the proposals, um, the quote-unquote dissenting view had to come to the table with another alternative that they felt other people could live with. It was a, a form of consensus that happened to work very well in this instance. Um, so they worked on these restoration principles, they worked on an implementation plan, so once the principles were put in place, how do you get those working on the ground, because that was everybody's uh, end goal. And uh, they ground truthed a lot of the discussions um, through field trips, which are also a very important component of collaborative efforts. Uh, and just so you get a sense, there's a lot more detail behind these restoration principles. 13 in total, um, I would say that there are, are uh, well, I don't, I don't know, I'm not going to read them all, uh, but restoring functioning ecosystems using adaptive management, um, monitoring those outcomes, reestablishing fire, really strongly uh, felt considering the social constraints um, that exist, uh, use collaboration and implementation, uh, improve terrestrial and aquatic habitat, emphasize goods and services and sustainable land management. Um, the third bullet on this page, integrate restoration with socioeconomic well-being. I put in one piece of the detail behind that because it's one of the few efforts I know of where the entire group agreed with this statement in addition to some other things there. But a sustainable, vibrant, integrated forest industry is critical to implementation of viable restoration projects. Um, so, and then uh, education and restoration, improving overall watershed health and establishing a safe road and trail system. Um, because a lot of collaborative efforts start on addressing the quote-unquote low-hanging fruit first, uh, although you can't tell from what is up there, the agreement, not surprisingly, was around mostly around restoring ponderosa pine ecosystems. Um, a couple years later, in 2010, the committee expanded its zone of agreement by um, working on an appendix for mixed conifer, mixed severity fire regime forests, which there's a lot of in Montana. It's the uh, harder agreement to come to um, in a collaborative process because the science is um, not all in agreement about what to do in those kind of systems. So in the implementation plan, what, what was laid out was there would be um, a steering committee to oversee the entire effort and help uh, things remain on track. Uh, there would still be a full working group. Um, many of the members of the original um, who came to the consensus on the principles, but people have come and gone since then. The full group meets twice a year and helps develop sort of broader policy level agreements. The real work, the on the ground work, gets done through forest restoration committees. The intent is to get at least one committee on every national forest in uh, Montana. Right now we're on the Lolo, the Bitterroot, uh, the Lincoln District of the Helena National Forest, and the Elkhorn Management Area, which is um, Helena and uh, the B Bar D. So there's a lot more information about this organization, um, and you can go to montanarestoration.org to find it. Uh, as far as projects being implemented, um, it's, it's taken a while to get uh, stuff going on the ground, partly due to Forest Service budgetary issues, uh, partly due to planning issues, and frankly, partly doing to, to do with the amount of time it takes to come to agreement. So. 
the um, committees on the Lolo National Forest have had a project implemented. Um, there has been some consensus developed on the Bitterroot, but no implementation as yet. Am I right, Bill? And uh, the Elkhorns and the, the um, Helena group just recently started. Um, I think that's pretty about, that's about it from a broad scale. And I'm ahead of time. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, this is going to parallel a little bit um, Mary Mitzo's presentation because it's been somewhat the same process in Utah, and I can't say we're um, doing uh, biomass utilization, but the, again, the principles of the collaboration um, are across the board and are applicable to um, biomass utilization. One, one of the collaboration groups has been the Utah Forest Restoration Working Group, which has as its purpose, um, through collaboration and consensus, agree on community-specific restoration guidelines. And the initial focus we chose was Aspen, um, much as the Montana group chose uh, uh, ponderosa pine, but not so much uh, because it was a low-hanging fruit, uh, but that the Forest Service was frustrated with the appeals and uh, uh, delays on what would be, um, what was being proposed as Aspen restoration and wanted to get a collaboration group together. Um, and so uh, our proposed outcomes were to achieve restoration and maintain environmental and economic health provide leadership to help land managers and their partners move forward with on-ground activities, that is, get past the appeals and the litigation, attain widespread diverse public support and momentum for accomplishing restoration in Aspen, work with existing programs that further the purpose of Aspen restoration, and use the principles in, this pro in, in Aspen to expand to other forest communities needing restoration. And the outcome, we started in 2009, set ourselves a year goal and came very close to it um, with our um, publication of guidelines for Aspen restoration on the national forest in Utah. And there's uh, been copies, I think some of you have picked them up at the Western Aspen Alliance um, table um, and they will be available afterwards. And there was the usual kind of, you've got to get all the stakeholders at the table, and I've colored a few. Um, the, the group was co-convened by Grand Canyon Trust and the Rural Life Foundation Stewardship Center. And um, I've colored a couple of others. Um, having Utah Department of Agriculture and Food with the recognition that some of the problems of Aspen have to do with overbrowsing, and that, of course, then involved also the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources because the overbrowsing is um, a combination of elk and or cattle um, and sometimes sheep and or deer. Um, then the last two, Utah Environmental Congress, is one that had been very active in bringing appeals and litigating and is at the table, was at the table, um, is, is today. And Western Aspen Alliance was critical for science information that was um, uh, of interest to the group. Um, when we came to our principles, um, one was to assess the condition of Aspen in the landscape area, including the determination of the Aspen types. That is, is it conifer overtopped Aspen? Is it pure Aspen? Is it Aspen in riparian areas? Then rely on site-specific data to target the underlying causes. And this is a real step forward because um, while fire suppression is one that is probably politically um, feasible to address generally um, by reinstituting fire and having prescribed fire in the conifer overtopped aspen communities to target the underlying causes of overbrowsing in pure aspen aspen that's lacking recruitment even though conifers don't overtop them involves grazing which is generally considered um, a separate department in the Forest Service or a, sep a separate sector and also brings into play um, the state agent, the wildlife agency. 
then select response options relevant to the particular stand type and the conditions and the underlying causes and landscape context and the guidelines um, list a bunch of response options and then monitor, of course, but that's also been one that has been lacking in the past and which a collaboration can help provide when the Forest Service is lacking in staff for that. So there, um, after we developed the principles, it wasn't um, soon, it was very soon after that three different ranger districts immediately wanted um, Aspen working groups, one on Pando clone, which is one of the kind of world famous Aspen clones. Uh, it's been long considered maybe one of the largest in the world and it's dying um, from lack of recruitment. Um, second, some collaborative monitoring on the Ashley National Forest up here in northern Utah. And then the biggest, um, most complex one is the Monroe Mountain Group, which is an entire mountain, a trophy elk hunting um, uh, mountain and a mountain as one of the collaborative working group people say is um, he never saw a mountain that so wanted to grow aspen as Monroe Mountain but it's got real problems with conifer overtopped aspen and you can kind of hardly see the aspen in that conifer um, picture on the left and then um, uh, a, a big problem of aspen that is um, had no recruitment for many years because um, of over browsing. So this Monroe Mountain Working Group has some of the members that were in the Utah Forest Restoration Working Group, but um, uh, also necessarily involved, it's, it's actually 34, uh, 32 members. It, it needed to include sheep permittees, cattle permittees, um, the local uh, wildlife biologists and uh, for the Division of Wildlife Resources, the Sevier County, and so on. So we did develop a desired Aspen condition, and this is maybe just looks like any old sentence to you, but as any collaboration person will say, sentences are hard won, um, because this talks about persistent Aspen communities with multi-age stems. That's very hard to get to. You've got to get a handle on the over-browsing if you're going to have multi-height or multi-age stems and adequate recruitment to perpetuate the communities. Again, not just looking at aspen as trees, but looking at them as a community of trees and forbs and grasses and shrubs, including site-appropriate biodiverse understories. Fire regimes are adequate. That means that's the desired condition. They are adequate to perpetuate aspen, particularly in er areas cereal to conifer, and that's recognizing that pure aspen its problem is not being dependent on fire. It's fire adapted, not fire dependent. And so fire cannot be the one, fit, one size fits all solution to the Aspen problems. Um, those are the stakeholders, among the stakeholders, and, and, and that is part of the 32 members. And we're just um, um, beginning to work. We started with a three day field trip where we camped out at night, which was important for the longer um, conversations and spent three days going to about 30 different locations on, on Monroe Mountain and we were all cross-eyed with all the complexity of, of Aspen by the end of the three days but it was a critical thing to do at the start. Um, and, and interestingly, and this is the last slide, um, this has somewhat helped to lead toward um, a rather historic step in the state of Utah, which is to have a grazing collaborative, um, which is to look at the ecological, economic, and, ecolo um, and, and it should, say, should have said social, I'm sorry, ecological, economic, and social sustainability of livestock grazing in southern Utah on the Dixie Fish Lake and Manti LaSalle National Forest. And the um, conveners, and I didn't mean the <laughs> different font sizes to represent importance, um, Utah Department of Natural Resources and the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. And that's quite a, um, um, like I say, a historic um, co-conveners for grazing on the national forests. And um, I think the reason this links to the forest collaboratives and illustrates that sometimes one collaboration leads to a much a much different one or a spin-off is that because Aspen in particular with the pure Aspen, in, in the case of pure Aspen, um, does invoke grazing, um, 
we realize to some degree we're constrained within the current kind of rigid habitual ways allotments by allotments are managed and if we're going to deal with the Aspen issue we're going to also have to deal with um, getting uh, different kinds of flexibility to work at a landscape scale rather than allotment by allotment on the Forest Service. And, and also it's a major step in the state of Utah to be um, recognizing that livestock grazing much as for, for a long time now we've been recognizing forest health and, and transportation planning is really a multi-stakeholder issue so, um, but in the past a lot of grazing has been considered um, a permittee forest service um, uh, process and has not traditionally engaged multi-stakeholders and, and this grazing collaborative which in part is related to and coming out of forest um, collaboration is, is, is illustrative of this growing recognition that because livestock grazing and ungulate browsing, wild ungulate browsing impacts fisheries and recreation and um, uh, pollinators and birds and so on that really is a multi-stakeholder. Um, it is ripe for multi-stakeholder collaboration. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next we have Bob Swanby, a, a wonderful number of uh, positions during his career that you can read about. Um, he also worked for the U.S. Department of Energy to help negotiate trilateral research agreements with both the Venezuelan and Canadian and U.S. governments. Uh, he's been working on a woody biomass utilization partnership and other organizations to promote woody biomass utilization in rural communities. He currently serves on its board, and he's the founding member of the Payette, am I saying that right? Yes. Forest Coalition. Please welcome Bob. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'll just be looking at you all, and you can look back at me. The clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. John Muir, that's a quote that I came across on a poster about probably 30 years ago in Washington, D.C., and I had no idea where it'd be leading me, except I really do and always have enjoyed the forest. In fact, I took a hike yesterday um, out in the canyon after we finished here. I came to forest collaboration and woody biomass utilization through work at the Idaho Department of Commerce about three and a half, four years ago. I was the economic development specialist for North Idaho. So every month I got on a plane, flew into Spokane and drove around all the little bergs in North Idaho from Bonners Ferry to St. Mary's, six, seven hundred miles a week. And the thing that jumped out at me besides trying to help businesses get started was how dense the forests were, how kind of unhealthy they looked in a lot of places. Um, beetle kill is starting to infect up there. And just the huge number of small diameter trees that are crowding out everything else. At that time, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do about it. But we subsequently had a meeting with the timber industry they weren't too keen on um, biomass being at the very low end of the chain. So I did start going to a four-county um, collaborative effort known as the Woody Biomass Utilization Partnership in southeast Idaho. They've been quite successful in getting grant funds and promoting business and, and starting to create markets in Woody Biomass Utilization. In June of 2009, uh, the director of the Woody Biomass Utilization Partnership got together uh, with myself and Dave Terrell of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and we started talking about the need to do some collaborative work for a number of reasons in any place that we could get started in, in North or Central Idaho 
and the Payette um, National Forest, who we had a working relationship with, said, great, we've got lots of areas that we'd like to work with. And we started talking with environmental organizations, um, recreationists. It's a really diverse group of about 30 people. And at our first couple of meetings, we came up with um, very clear, specific things that we wanted to achieve. First, we wanted to do something fairly significant, and we define that as a landscape scale collaboration of being landscape scale is 100,000 acres or more. Um, the Payette obliged and certainly showed us a very um, interesting parcel on the Mill Creek Council Mountain um, area in central Idaho. It's it's interesting because of the terrain. Um, there's watershed problems. Uh, the white-headed woodpecker has been decreasing. Um, and there's also plantations that are up to 30 years old in that area. So we thought that that would be a good place to start. And the other thing that we definitely wanted to get out of the collaboration was stewardship contracting so that we could remove biomass and pay for some of the other things we wa wanted to do with receipts. Uh, in June 9th, those two entities, the Partnership and the Rocky Mountain Elf Foundation, convened the collaboration. Um, we defined goals of helping uh, communities in the Payette to find jobs through biomass, to improve watershed and wildlife habitat, to reduce wildfire hazard, and to, um, yeah, I think I've, I've covered that, to remove biomass in support of the other, three, the other three goals. So our collaborations were, our meetings were about once a month in the beginning and every other month or so once we got rolling. There were some really difficult issues that we addressed that, with regard to stand treatment um, tr stands that shouldn't be treated, etc. A lot of tug and pull with environmental organizations. Uh, we did achieve recommendations in March of this year. And the EIS, uh, which has just been released and is now out for, for review, covers some of these areas that I'd just like to mention. Applying restoration, thinning treatments to four stands followed by prescribed burning. And so we actually did narrow down the 100,000 acres to 50,000 acres because the Forest Service only had good data at that time on, on that larger parcel. We will address the second 50,000 acres uh, in the next few years. Create openings in the forest canopy where vigorous fire re resistant trees are absent, wildlife habitat openings will be retained. Return fire to the ecosystem, promoting the development of large-scale forest structures mixed with mosaic of size classes and improving stand health, growth, species, composition, and resiliency to insects, disease, and fire. That's a topic we've heard a lot about today, um, how much stress our forests are under, and that's particularly true in Idaho. I went to presentation just before this that Sarah gave on um, regional volumes of regional trends in volumes of biomass and I'm afraid to say that Idaho is the bad poster boy of dead and dying uh, increase of biomass over the last 10 to 15 years which just confirmed my trips to North Idaho. We want to thin plantations and remove biomass in older stands. We want to uh, remove biomass in treatment areas. And we have defined uh, out of the 50,000 acres, there are about five to 6,000 acres that we can remove substantial amounts of biomass from. And also, we want to improve recreational opportunities and construct um, a motorized trail and decommission roads that are no longer needed. There was considerable controversy with the recreationists um, and the backcountry chorus people about these roads and the ranchers as well because there was a lot of confusion about what decommissioning meant. In some cases, it just d 
doesn't mean taking them out and obliterating them. It means just not maintaining them or turning them into trails, and we think we have some good possibilities for that. I want to move to um, why this collaboration has been successful to date, and we're only in the planning phase. We still have the implementation and monitoring, and monitoring stages to go. But I think there, there are at least three or four specific reasons, and they will back up um, Mary, what Mary said this morning. First of all, we have a very good facilitator and a, an incredible scribe who has kept all of our notes and the Forest Service um, recommendations and maps on our website, which is www.spatialinterest s-p-a-t-i-a-l uh, dot info and if you go to that website and look on the left hand side you'll see the pay at forest restoration and if you want um, to view our recommendations in detail if you want to see the transcripts of our notes they're all there in great detail <clears throat> um, Secondly, we had a, a really good steering committee, and they were there to help us set the agenda, and they played a very important role when we couldn't agree. Uh, we, we set a standard that in order for this to work, we had the phrase, can you live with it? Even if we were disagreeing, the, the committee would first try to resolve the issue, and ultimately, we would come back to, can you live with this decision? And sometimes it was grudging, but we reached consensus on every single major decision we had to make. And I'll tell you, that wasn't easy. A third reason why I think we're successful and will be successful in the future is I requested that we make the Pay It Forest Coalition a learning organization. I don't know if any, any of you have heard of Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline. Um, if you haven't, I would encourage you to get a copy of it. The Fifth Discipline is systems thinking. What Peter points out in his book is that we in the West tend to break things down when we're trying to solve problems and then bring them back to a whole. Usually, the sum of the parts don't add up to necessarily a good whole. Um, I'd like to just read one paragraph from his book that gives you an idea of what systems thinking is. It's a framework for seeing interrelationships rather than things, for seeing patterns of change rather than static snapshots. The discipline of system thinking begins with a shift in awareness. You become aware of interdependencies. People consistently take actions to, today that make apparent, quote, good sense, unquote, based on the limited information and understanding they have, but they don't see the connection with longer-term consequences. Indeed, many later problems do occur because of our, quote, best efforts, unquote. The problem is more in how we think rather than the situations in which we react. If we start to think systemically, how might we act differently? Will it make us more able to create what we really want Systems thinking is a discipline for seeing holes. So I think I've about run out of my time. Um, what I wanted to emphasize is the process is, is as important as getting where you want to go. And we in our coalition are always working on our process. And as long as I'm there, I hope that's the case. Very much. I, I wondered if any of you would like to talk about times of chaos and the meaning that they have in collaborations. I think, at least in our, our collaboration, there's initial time of discomfort. And the way we address that was you just have to have several meetings where people get to know each other a little bit personally because once you have more of a personal investment in this person isn't such a bad person after all just because they have different views from you 
then you can start working on things in common. And there were also periods when we reached disagreement, when we had a lot of disagreement and we were trying to reach disagreement. And I think in our case, um, we, had a very, we have a very skilled uh, facilitator. You just have to keep going and move through those moments. Um, sometimes uh, we, we even had working lunches, so sometimes you just maybe got to take a 10 minute break and then come back to it. But you got to move through it. So um, I say if you don't have chaos and conflict, you're not going to get anywhere because you come to the table because you have disagreements. And if you can't find a way to work through them, you are not going to make forward movement. And, and uh, I agree, it's where a facilitator comes in to make sure that that chaos doesn't escalate to a, a level of um, violence or something else, but that finds a way to work through it. And, and as it's been said a couple times, this, this rule about if you don't like something, then think uh, you're responsible for coming forward with what you think someone could live with. And, I, and sometimes that happens right in the meeting, and sometimes it can happen outside. I know when we were on that three-day field trip, I was having a, a, a difference with someone about... Um, how to monitor something. And, and finally, the facilitator said, you know, maybe you two ought to just go in a car yourselves, you know. <laughs> so I, you know, hopped in his car, and between that and the next stop, we just kind of had a Donnybrook, and out of it came a really innovative solution. Um, so I think, and, and the, we both got really excited about it, and that's what we're working on and, and, and going to refine next year. And I think that's a real, the conflict is a real, because the conflicts are often long-standing and come out of long-standing different perspectives. And that's the whole value of a collaboration. Because when you are committed to dealing with that conflict, you will come up with out-of-the-box solutions. Because the old solutions didn't work. And so it's almost like the, the, whole um, source of innovation in collaborations is conflict. Okay. Yes, sir. There's a couple of models that uh, I guess we've seen around the, around the West uh, dealing with collaboration. One is, is looking at a large landscape, even state, statewide level and development some overall principles and then move down to project level. And there are some that have worked more at the on the ground, but started it more at the on the ground and and looked at more of the project uh, level. Could you I guess share your right thoughts and ideas when one approach might be appropriate when the other might be appropriate. It's Mary and Mary. <laughs> um, my personal opinion is that there's no approach that's better than another because you got to get to both places. And, and um, you start at one and you deal with A lot of it is who's at the table initially, whether they think at that 30,000 foot level or they think at that uh, project level. Yeah, and I'd second that. In the case here in Utah, for instance, we're in the fifth year of a collaboration, well, actually two years of intensive work and now three years of implementation and effectiveness monitoring. We're in our fifth year on just two moderate size grazing um, allotments. And you would think that is an awful lot of time and, and forest service um, expenditure of staff and, and monitoring and, and collaboration time and everyone else's time. but. I think every collaboration, even if it's very local and specific, has within it the seeds of solutions for larger ones, because it's generally the s similar problems get played out again and again. And secondly, if you haven't had collaborations in a particular resource type area, then that very specific one helps show people that maybe a bigger one would work, because this was 
a difficult one, and it came to a good uh, conclusion, and so the bigger one would work. So I think it works, it can work both ways. Do you want to? Sure, I know how to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Scott, I, you, thank you for the softball. Um, you know, the, 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 it's all specific to what the issue is. And um, as, as you know, um, I've been talking with uh, Dale, my, basically my counterpart here in the Utah area. And, and really the issues that we're dealing with are the same issues that Lance Lindblom are dealing with. And dealing with them in a vacuum and fragmented is not, does not make sense. And the more people that get into the swimming pool, the better. And um, you know, I, I kind of think it depends on the issue and it depends on the circumstances. So, you know, I think you already knew your own answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, the process that we identified? Yeah, and, and, and really fortunately for us is that um, determining what the projects are and where they are is really in the hands of the resource manager experts. They're the ones that are driving the NEPA process and they're the ones who are determining what watersheds have the, um, the conflict. Or, or the need the treatments. So really, it, let the professionals do, in my opinion, the professional job. Our, our really, our support here is to make sure that science is supporting them, and then trying to get it so that I can answer Jose Noriega in the um, in the face and say that two hundred dollar investment you made is going to return a $100 um, uh, dividend to you in the future. So we're fortunate. We don't have to make that decision where it is. The professionals are doing that. Did that answer your question? The funding apparatus, well, um, actually right now, the uh, Forest Service has applied for a, um, a collaborative forestry restoration uh, grant. Um, they're hearing on it this week in, in Salt Lake City. Um, the, the local Ely District and the local um, uh, Ely Forest Service have joined a partnership and they have pooled their resources and their restoration dollars. They're working on a joint restoration project right now on Ward Mountain. Um, they have a stewardship project um, in place. They have over uh, 300,000 acres that they have identified and that they have put into the hopper. I think, Jeremy, that they have 30,000 acres NEPA cleared right now. I think it's 30,000 NEPA cleared. And so they have, they have put it in motion and they made it part of their rack, and, and not their rack, their RMP, their management plan, so that they have formalized it and they have dollars. The problem is, where do those dollars come from? They come from, um, you know, they come from the state office, and they come from, um, they come from national uh, headquarters, and and so those monies are being diminished. We all know that, and so if they get scaled back 20 percent next year, then they'll scale those projects back 20 percent. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is break that nut that that utilization does not help increase acres treated. We're trying to get that so that. Instead of costing $200 more an acre, it costs $100 less so that they can increase their treatment by 20%. I, I, it, I wish it was easier. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, Mary Mintosa, I, I got the impression from your presentation this morning that collaborative groups have been around longer than I thought and perhaps are more common than I thought. So my question is actually, polling of the audience. I'm curious how many people in here, by a raise of hands, have been involved in a formal collaborative group. <laughs> Are you looking around? Well, it's not everybody, yeah. but it's pretty yeah. many. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised about that. Because, because even though her presentation was quite eloquent, I don't really feel like you get a feel for it until you're in the thick of these things and, and see some of the, the ugliness and also some of the positive outcomes. 
mostly positive. I'd be an advocate. I'm just curious about that. Good question. Yes, sir. I'm curious for, for each of you with the uh, auditors that you're in, if you could just describe briefly who invited you or who initiated that collaboration. Well, in in our case, there is a general sense of frustration in Idaho um, about the lack of progress in, in thinning the forests and managing the forests. So in, in my case, I would say myself, along with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Woody Biomass Utilization Partnership, um, thought it would be a good idea, so we talked to other folks, other uh, environmental organizations and they thought it was a good idea. So once we got kind of a, a five or six group consensus, then we decided to go ahead and convene it. And, and then we wanted to make sure we invited a wide range of people. They didn't necessarily all show up, but we tried to invite as a wide range of uh, interests as we could. I'm going to pass because uh, I'm involved in a lot of them, but usually at the facilitator level and not necessarily at the participant level. Well, it's an interesting question because I do think they come about different ways. In the case of the Tusher Allotments collaboration, it came out of an appeal by um, Grand Canyon Trust and some other organizations, and in the appeal resolution process, we proposed a collaboration on two of the eight allotments saying, okay, Forest Service, um, you can we'll let six of them go and because we did think we had a legal case uh, but in exchange let's collaborate on two of them and you can choose the two that we collaborate on. In the case of the Utah Forest Restoration Working Group, the Aspen Restoration, I remember being out on a timber sale with the Dixie National Forest Supervisor and we, um, both Utah Environmental Congress and, and the Trust were had appealed um, a, a a form of that sale. We went out on the ground um, and the forest supervisor said, you know, I'm just sick of not being able to get any Aspen restoration going. Um, you appeal everything. We said, well, let's, let's work it out. We don't think what, a lot of what you're doing is really Aspen restoration, so let's have a collaboration. Um, it, 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 but, but the Forest Service needs, you know, to, to not get into the bureaucracy of FACAs of you know federal advisory committees, it, it, you need co-conveners or conveners that that are outside the agency. So in the case of the Tusher Allotments collaboration, it was Grand Canyon Trust and the um, Rural Development Agency. Uh, it was an NGO, the timber one. In the case of the Utah Forest Restoration Working Group, right now it's Western Aspen Alliance and the Trust as the co-conveners. And then in the, once we got the guidelines, three different district rangers wanted pro working groups, and we have different co-chairs on all those working groups. So it can come, you know, the idea can come from the agency, it can come from a citizen, it can come from anywhere. But it's pretty compelling, you know. Uh, um, the suggestion of collaboration and some ideas on who would participate um, uh, is, pr is pretty, in it's like a person says, huh, maybe that's a way out. You're stopping there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our collaboration um, started despite the fact that the Humboldt Taiabi uh, National Forest and the State Office of BLM didn't know that they needed a collaboration. Um, and, and really, um, two of the four people that um, uh, were the instigators are in this room, uh, Scott Bell and myself, and Scott kind of got drug into it. And really, it was um, Sarah Adler, who's the um, Rural Development um, uh, Office Manager or the head of the Rural Development for the state of Nevada, who's been a 30-year friend of mine. Um, and uh, a gentleman named uh, John McLean and I drove to uh, Ely and um, uh, then, then Dusty Moeller uh, took Sarah out and, and showed her that, that opinion is, is really not a bush. And, um, um, you know, it went from there. And, and really, the, the driving issue is, is that the four of us think that utilization can reduce the cost of treatment. And that's what the genesis of it was and why we have a collaboration. Our collaboration is open to all. 
um, go to our webpage and uh, all you need to do is sign up. I, I, our, our exam and our application are really tough. Uh, John, would you like to be a member? And, and I'll just say one other thing. I mean, it's interesting to, to watch this over time. In the beginning, when a lot of these collaborative efforts started, it, it was um, local leaders at the community level and not necessarily, usually not actually elected leaders, but those um, quiet leaders who have a, a strong social network within the communities. And they sometimes started in spite of the federal agencies. Um, now it's, it's much more um, a little bit of everything, depending on where you are. Aaron, do we have time for one more question? One more question. Okay. Is there another question out there? Um, go ahead. Um, my question would be, uh, I think we're getting an understanding there's a lot of work and there's, there's a real investment to make a collaborative successful. And uh, try to put this in a question form, but my perception is, is that perhaps uh, uh, for agencies at least, line officers may, may not have a full understanding when they say, okay, you're our representative in, 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 this, in this collaborative effort, go, go take care of it and, you know, I wash, not wash my hands, but I just, one less thing for me to be worried about, and that's appropriate. But do you run into situations where down the road that uh, that, that becomes an issue because that, that line officer is now is saying, wow, you're really spending a lot of time, a lot of your energy there. We need to do these other things. If that kind of response happens, is the first question, where, where, where someone is saying it's taking too much time, it's too much, before the, before the results come about, the, the, the cost is, and if so, how do you handle that? I, I, think, um, I think you need to understand going into it, understand the concept of collaboration, that it is going to be a long, time-consuming process. Um, the way it's worked, I will say in the Payette Forest collaboration, we have had fantastic support from the Forest Service staff. And uh, the, the forest supervisor has been at most of the meetings, um, the district ranger. But at times, obviously, they're busy. Our meetings go five hours because people drive two hours to get there. So sometimes I think you can just work and maybe um, have a well-briefed staff person if, if you're not required to make a decision at that particular meeting. Um, there's, there's ways of working it out, but I think the most important thing is to understand that if you really want it to work, you've got to spend the time and it's going to be a lot of time and it's a real commitment. Otherwise, it's not going to work. I do think, I do think it's important that for, mo for continuity and for efficient reaching of of um, implementable decisions, it needs to have people from agencies who can actually make decisions. In, in one of the collaborations, we had to back up and it delayed stuff for um, um, a few months because um, one of the agencies had, had not sent a decision maker, didn't like where it was going, and then the whole collaboration had to back up and reconfigure stuff, and that's that is a, a real problem. So, um, decision makers are important, and then secondly, facilitators are extremely important because they can make sure that time isn't being wasted. If they're a real professional, and they work ahead of the time with what, the executive committee or a steering committee or a couple of people to set an agenda and they stick to the agenda, then people, then everyone in the collaboration can feel that it's going forward and, and work can be put off onto um, smaller committees to draft stuff. But I do think the momentum is incredibly important and that does take professional facilitation. And that is um, a problem at the startup of some collaborations because you're first getting together to even figure out will this work and who should we have at it you don't yet have a facilitator and bridging that time 
between when you actually can get the funds together and get, get a, a permanent facilitator is a particular gap that I think, uh, I know in the case of the Tusher Collaborators, US, US, uh, U.S. Institute of Environmental Conflict Resolution out of um, Tucson, um, sent a facilitator free for two times. It was real clear they weren't going to be able to do it long term, but that sometimes bridging that gap with a real professional so you're not mushing around at the start and losing people right at the start is incredibly important. The whole issue of facilitation is, is worthy of the highest attention. I think that covered the topic really well. I wanted to go one just conversely, and that is when you have a uh, federal um, representative who is not engaged in the process. He was appointed to it, and he's not interested, and that's when somebody in your collaboration needs to be able to call um, Amy or Jeannie, um, the state director of BLM or the state forester, and say, that person, um, we need to talk because that does occur too. And we had that one time, one phone call, and oh, how can we help you? <laughs> Just before we leave, um, I am a member of the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership. That's another collaborative. And this is a save the date, uh, January 31st and February 1st in Boise. We are sponsoring a two-day interactive um, conference the first day is going to be practical tools for collaborators, uh, expanding the zone of agreement and in restoring dry forests and examining the challenges of mixed severity forests. Day two is going to be really interesting as well. It's going to be potential roles of biomass energy and wood products in supporting forest restoration. And we're going to be getting some national and international speakers to address the economics uh, of biomass and biomass projects and um, agency people and all sorts of people involved in project development would benefit from that conference and there'll be more details when we get our speakers lined up which will be soon. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. Other comments or questions right now? Well, I have a quick question actually. Um, what if you don't have all the stakeholders at the table initially? You may or may not know who all the stakeholders are. How do you handle new people coming into the group? I know you discussed what if they're, they're leaders and they're supposed to be making decisions. Um, how do you deal with that? Uh, we had that issue in the Payette Forest collaboration. Um, I think we initially sent an invitation out to some ranchers and they didn't respond. And uh, then one or two of them showed up and they were pretty unhappy. Um, not. Not so much, I, I don't think that they weren't invited and, and welcomed, which they were, but they had issues with the Forest Service. And what we did is invite them out on our tours. Uh, we went on several tours to um, examine the stands that were going to be pot potentially treated. And we invited them back. We really made an effort to listen to their concerns. They had really big fears that their their cattle migration routes were going to be interrupted by what we were doing. We assured them that that wasn't the case. Uh, I think they're just really independent folks, and they probably still aren't 100 percent convinced, but I think we went a long way towards reassuring them that what we were doing would be helpful and not detrimental to their interests. Yeah, just one quick one. Sometimes you don't, although you have the discussion at the start, who all should be there? Is everyone at the table here that should be? Um, there's a couple times we've recognized part way into the process that really there's another interest that should be there given the direction that the solutions are going. But if you have real clear operating principles that you're working under and real clear minutes um, of what you've done and tasks you've done, that person can come in as long as you don't have to redo the working principles and you're not backing up and, and undoing work you did. So.